Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and we are here today taking a look at uh, the current British Army Standard Sniper Rifle. This is the L115A3, and it is chambered for the 338 Lapua Magnum, really huge cartridge. Now, the roots of this rifle uh, in British service go back to the early to mid-1990s. Uh, Accuracy International had developed their Arctic Warfare Rifle, which by the way, had its origins in the original British L96 sniper, then the British L118 sniper used in limited numbers by special forces, and then for the international market they developed this rifle, they basically scaled up the Arctic Warfare 308 to 338 Lapua Magnum to give extended range, extended ballistic capability. And this wasn't specifically for the British military, it was on a commercial international basis, and when people started taking an interest in it, the British military was there at the same time, British Special Forces specifically, thinking, no, this is an, this is an interesting development, we should get some of these and we should try them out. Um, originally this was purchased as the L-115A1 in the 90s, and probably saw some service uh, in the invasion of Iraq where you're in a desert environment. There are potentially very long-range target engagements to be made. So British Special Forces had a small number of these, and they're the A1s, uh, which by the way are distinct for a couple of reasons. They would have had fixed stocks, not folding stocks. They would have had uh, Parker Hale bipods, the same as uh, were used on the L118, uh, and they would have had a, a smaller uh, 3 to 12 power scope on them. Anyway, they were using these, and and liked them. Um, it's a fantastic rifle, it's an extremely effective rifle. And uh, the A2 version was developed over the coming years, and uh, the A2 saw plenty of service in Afghanistan with British Special Forces. The A2 pattern, uh, they replaced the Parker Hale bipods with basically the same sort of bipod as had been on the L96 rifle. Uh, it came up with a little adapter to mount the original L96 type bipod onto a Parker Hale plug mount, used that. Uh, they, it was at that point that they got the folding stocks, and a lot of the A1s were upgraded into A2 pattern guns um, as part of that process. By 2008, well 2007 to 2008, um, the, the British Army decided, uh, the, the whole field army, that it needed to really kind of overhaul its sniping program. And they weren't just looking at the rifle, they were looking at the entire all of the equipment associated with sniping. So they took a lot of the lessons learned by the Special Forces and applied them in areas with things like adapting night vision and thermal optical sights uh, to sniper rifles, which we see here, we'll talk about that in a moment, and then ancillary gear like laser range finders, wind meters, um, good spotting scopes, everything, the, the whole sniping package. The program was called SSIP, the Sniper System Improvement Program, and it resulted in the general adoption of the L115A3, which is this rifle, by the British military, um, including a number of updates at that point. So the rifle went from the A2 to the A3 pattern. Uh, they upgraded the bipods, they got rid of the old L96 type bipods and went with a Harris bipod. They increased the, uh, the size and magnification of the scope. They went to a Schmidt and Bender 5x25, 5 5'2", 25, 5 25 power scope, uh, integrated in mounts for thermal and for image intensification, night vision scopes into it, um, and really came up with a fantastic complete package for very long range heavy sniper rifles. With the adoption of the 338 Lapua Magnum, the British really kind of took a, a step up in power that was not uh, typical at the time. Generally, everyone else had been, and to a large extent still is, quite happy with something in the 308 uh, 7.62 NATO range, or failing that, often people are interested, militaries even, are interested in cartridges that are uh, have the same basic power level, but are perhaps a bit more aerodynamically capable, so six and a half millimeter type cartridges. Going up to 338 Magnum is, uh, well, it was done largely because of the combat in Afghanistan. Uh, just for comparison's sake, here's a 7.62 NATO snap cap compared to a 338 Lapua Magnum. So really this is, I mean, this is like the same sort of increase as you might see from 5.56 to 7.62 NATO. Um, it's a really big cartridge. 
And in Afghanistan and the Middle East, the British have been putting this to very good use, fairly regularly using these rifles effectively out to 2,000 meters and beyond. Um, for a while, the the longest uh, sniper engagement record uh, was 20, just over 2,400 meters, which was done with one of these rifles. Um, I believe that's been surpassed by the Canadians, but that doesn't take anything away from the capabilities of of the L115. If we look at the specific features we've got here, uh, most of them are basically the same as the previous Arctic Warfare rifles, just slightly larger in scale. So the folding stock here is basically identical. I'm going to open up right there. Um, we have the interchangeable spacers in the butt plate. We have the rear monopod wheel. There we go. Um, that can come out all the way down to there. We have the same three position safety selector, fire. The center, center position here locks the trigger but leaves the bolt free to operate, and the rear position locks the bolt and the trigger. We have our uh, cocked indicator, firing pin indicator out the back, uh, the continuing legacy of that very early problem with the L96. Uh, if you haven't seen the video on the L96, I think it's definitely worthwhile to put this rifle in context. So um, that'll be in a link at the very end of this one, and I highly recommend taking a look at it. The magazine on the L115 is a single stack five round magazine. That is a decrease, yeah, marked 338 there. That is a decrease from the 308 rifles, but that makes sense with a cartridge this large. Uh, a 10 round magazine would be kind of awkwardly big. As I mentioned earlier, the A3 model of this rifle uh, standardized on a Harris bipod. Um, the previous Parker Hale style of bipods had simply been a little too high and just generally not well liked. Of course it also has an adjustable cheek rest, so you can loosen those two screws up and adjust the cheek rest to whatever height is convenient for your optic and uh, your own facial structure. What was a single port muzzle brake on the 308 rifles is a two port brake on, there we go, on the 338 rifles. This uh, also has a threaded muzzle for use with a suppressor, which was issued with the rifle. You will notice that it has a front sight block, just like the L118. Uh, this is normally where you would attach backup iron sights. However, the British military never actually issued uh, those iron sights with this rifle. They didn't procure them nor issue them. And that's for a couple of reasons. First off, the extreme range capability of these guns can't be duplicated with iron sights. Your iron sight effective range was considered to be about 600 meters, and you know that's a third or so the effective range of this rifle with an optic. So if your optic breaks, you can't replace it with iron sights anyway. Secondly, the British logistical and procurement system has significantly improved, and uh, you don't really have to worry about dealing with a broken optic for very long at all before you can get a replacement. And perhaps most interestingly of all, this rifle was fielded as part of a two-man sniper team, of course, and the secondary, the, the spotter in the team, carried a sniper support weapon, which is uh, the L129, which was the LMT. It's basically a 308 caliber AR-15. And that rifle was equipped with the, the uh, 3 to 12 power, often with the sniper teams. Uh, standard on that was a 6 power ACOG, but they often set them up with the 3 to 12 power Schmidt and Bender, which could be pulled off of that rifle and dropped right onto this rifle. And the, the LMT 308 uh, has a, a very nice set of iron sights on it. So in the event that your optic went down on one of these, it, the, the most effective thing you could do would be to take the optic off of your spotter's rifle, spotter goes to iron sights, and the sniper now has not quite as good of a scope, uh, you know, a substantially less powerful scope, but still a very high quality scope. We have our serial number here on the side. The first two digits, as usual, are the production year. So this is a 2016 production gun, which is a commercial production gun. This one isn't actually Army issue. Um, all of the military issue rifles were produced in 2008. There will be a total of 582 of them. Uh, so serial number, prefix, and, and date there. However, this rifle has been marked in the pattern of a standard military rifle. So that was actually done custom uh, by Accuracy International for this rifle's owner. And so as a result, we can see what the official military markings are. 
uh, and no longer metric, of course, because it's 0.338 inch uh, L115A3. And then we have Accuracy International. Accuracy is kind of hidden behind the cosine indicator here, tells you what angle you're pointing the rifle at. The barrel that the British Army wanted, specifically wanted, on the L115 is a fluted barrel, a heavy fluted barrel. Um, interestingly, Accuracy International does not offer this fluted barrel on any of their other production, either military or civilian, because they have found there to be potential accuracy issues as a result of using a fluted barrel. Uh, they're willing to do it for the British military, but uh, because they thought there might potentially be issues with fluting and accuracy, they opted to not offer them on any of their other production. So it is, if you see a fluted barrel on one of these rifles, it is only possible for it to be a British military rifle. Taking off the rear scope cover there, you can see the markings on the scope. This is a Schmidt and Bender 5 to 25 by 56. So uh, a larger scope both in uh, bell diameter and also in magnification than the, the previous L118 and L96 scopes. You have your magnification adjustment here. You have an illuminated reticle here. You have your focus there from very close ranges all the way out to well, all the way out to uh, infinite, which is just over a thousand, which is you know, half the effective range of this thing. Uh, the elevation dial for this optic is a bit different than the previous ones. Uh, commercially, Schmidt and Bender calls this uh, a dual turn uh, scope, where the elevation turret actually has two uh, full uh, rotations uh, of adjustment to it. So your bottom numbers, well, all of these are milliradians. And you have these little windows up at the top, and when you uh, rotate this all the way through to its first, to the end of its first rotation, those windows will turn yellow, and that will tell you that you're at the top end of your elevation adjustment, and these are your, your mill markings. Previously, uh, the top set of numbers would be a BDC. There is no BDC on this, this particular rifle. Same thing, we have tenth of a mil clicks for uh, windage. The reticle in the L24 5-25 to scope uh, is very similar to that in the earlier L17A1 scope. Uh, your center crosshair has mill dots in it, and then you have a range-finding uh, system at the bottom. That is uh, 4, 6, 800, and 1,000 meters, uh, and that is the waist of a man to the top of the head. Um, really the only difference between this and the earlier reticle uh, is that this is a little bit finer. One major part of the, the 2008 British um, Sniper Improvement Program was the implementation of a system for night vision and thermal scopes, and this is the mounting bracket for the night vision scope. I don't have one to show you, but if you take a look at a previous video on the L118, uh, you'll see the, the smaller version of it. Basically, the night vision scope mounted up here and dropped down in front of your your scope, so that you actually continue to look through the scope as normal, um, and the, the image intensifier took light in here, and then has a big tube up on top that does its intensification, and then it displays uh, the result back down here so you can see it through your scope. Interestingly, this mount is actually a separate part of the whole scope mount system. So you can take this mount off, and you're left with the same scope ring that you have in the back. The second part of that system was this rail on the side of the rifle. This mounts into this front bipod uh, block, and this is for holding the, the sticks, which is the, uh, the thermal scope uh, element of the system. So this block is removable, you can see the screws there, but uh, typically it's, it was just left installed in the rifle. Honestly, this thing weighs so much as it is that the addition of a little extra chunk of aluminum on the front uh, isn't that big of a deal in comparison. One interesting element to note is uh, these rear monopod feet, which are standard on the military versions of all of the Arctic Warfare rifles that the British have used, are a military-only option and not available on the standard civilian production guns. So um, Arctic Warfare, or um, Accuracy International, makes only one pattern of the mold for this, you know, the rear stock here. And you'll notice that this one has been clearly cu cut by hand to give space for this rear monopod. Normally this is a little loop uh, for your hand 
uh, to support the back of the rifle. And for the military pattern stocks, uh, they actually have to be cut out by hand, as you can see this one has been. Interestingly, in lieu of even trying to use a BDC, the British Army has made some, some impressive advances in general sniper training uh, programs. They actually currently now have what they call ASATS, which is the Advanced Small Arms Targeting System, which is a computerized set, basically set of uh, ballistic data sheets, where you, you chronograph the rifle, and then based on uh, muzzle velocity, you select a series of holdovers uh, dependent on bullet BC and temperature, so you know, hot, temperate, arctic, and that gives you all of your holdover data out to 2,000 meters. Um, this doesn't, uh, you know, this doesn't serve as a complete substitute for properly zeroing the rifle, obviously, um, and it's the sort of data you would, with practice, want to confirm. But rather, it's a huge step forward from just having a really sort of uh, autonomous BDC number, you know, scribed onto a scope that may or may not work for whatever environment you have to be in. Um, they're they're really making strides forward in making military snipers much, much more effective shooters. It's interesting to note, you can see the uh, the Afghan influence, the desert warfare influence on this rifle, uh, just in the outside of the stocks as much as anything else, where it's no longer the green mini of the L96, it's now kind of a desert coyote brown. These continue to serve uh, with the British military today, they're quite well liked. Um, the Special Forces has, have actually moved kind of one step beyond, and where this rifle was designed specifically for 338 Lapua Magnum using a 250 grain projectile, by the way has 2900 to 3000 feet per second muzzle velocity, it's really a pretty hefty cartridge. Um, Special Forces has found that they really actually can get about another 100 meters of effective range with a 300 grain bullet. The problem is, the magazine and the receiver on these rifles isn't quite long enough to accept a 300 grain projectile. The overall length of the cartridge just gets just a hair too long. So uh, for a while British Special Forces were actually just single loading 300 grain rounds into these rifles. What they have come up with is the A4 pattern of the rifle, which has a lengthened magazine and magazine well to accept a 300 grain bullet and British Special Forces are currently using that, the L115A4, and there is a program in place to upgrade all of the Army's existing uh, A3 rifles to the A4 spec. Uh, for a while that was kind of a priority, it appears now it's become less of a priority and will probably not happen until like 2030. So uh, at this point, uh, as of late 2018, the projected plan is for the L115A3, this guy, uh, to remain the standard British service rifle for another 10 to probably maybe 15 years, um, by which point I'm sure they will be ready to uh, to adapt it, develop it into something uh, new, or at least replace the rifles because they'll be getting a bit old at that point. So anyway, um, a big thanks to Steve Houghton for allowing us to take a look at this L115A3. As you might imagine, these are not particularly uh, common rifles to find these days, being a, a current military issue item. So, um, he has written a book on the whole history of British sniper rifles, focusing in particular on the rifles and their accessories and ancillary equipment. It's called The British Sniper, A Century of Evolution, and if you're interested in this you should definitely check out the description text below. I have a link in there where you can pick up a copy of his book, which has quite a bit more information on this rifle as well as all of its predecessors and a lot of its ancillary equipment. Thanks for watching.